God is so good. As a young man, I remember just kind of growing up and always being a little nervous to ask questions. You know, you grow up and you think, you know, is my question going to be the right question? You know, if I ask this question, is somebody going to look at me and say, you know, that's a really foolish thing to ask? Are people going to think that what I'm asking just doesn't make sense in the environment that I'm asking it in? And as I've been developing and growing as a man, the people that have been around in my life, and as you get to encounter other leaders, you recognize some of the best leaders ask questions. Some of the people that are looking to be developed in the maturity ask questions. And so in my life and with Christ, I've been asking him, God, I want you to show things to me. I want you to reveal things to me. I want to know what I need to change in my life to draw closer to you. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you, wherever you're watching and wherever you're sitting this morning, would you do that? Would you just ask the Holy Spirit this morning, say, God, I want you to reveal in me what needs to change, what needs to be developed. God, I want to draw closer to you. I want to see you in new ways. God, I want a revival in my life to take place because I want to operate from a place of boldness. And last week, we had the opportunity to listen to our senior pastor, Philip, and he did an incredible job talking about what is bold faith. What does that really mean and what does that look like? And if you were tuning in and paying attention to the message, and even if you didn't see it last week, I would encourage you to go online and watch it because the precursor to today is him introducing what is bold faith and what does that really mean. But about midway through his message, he was talking about being set free. He was talking about when, you know, Egypt and the, and, and the Israelites were set free and how in our lives right now, we don't have to live in captivity anymore, but we can live in freedom and in boldness and what he's called us to do. And I just want to give you the encouragement this morning that while the world is being shaken, God is steady. That sitting in a place of unrest and fear, God brings peace and hope and life. And so when you're sitting there this morning, you're saying, God, I want you to reveal in me and in my spirit what you want to show me today. It's okay to ask a question. Because we want you to understand that what we talk about today, what we want to bring forward is to say, how do I be my best for God? We want to operate in a place to say, God, I want to be giving you my best. I want to be my best because I want to make sure that I'm fulfilling the call on my life and the plans and purposes that you have for me. God is good and he is faithful. The Bible shows us time and time again that history in itself is not circular, but rather it's linear. So what that means is that in all things, there's a beginning and an end. God knows that we only have a finite amount of time to do what he's called us to do. He's showing us every single time what that exactly means. And what God is showing us is that if history itself is not circular but linear, that we all have the opportunity to do what he's calling us to do and to move forward in the plans and purposes of our life. Even the earth in itself is going to perish. Nothing is going to last other than an eternity with Christ. And it's with this thought in my mind, and I'm hoping that it's in your mind this morning, that as it rattles around, is that if I only have a finite amount of time and God's calling me to be my best, should it then affect how I live my life? Yes. Absolutely, it should affect the way that you live your life, understanding that we only have a certain amount of time to be our best for God. The Bible actually says this to us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. The Bible says, Since everything will be gone one day, what kind of a person should you be? Should I be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God. As you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The Bible is saying, and if you caught it, to do our best. And to do our best is actually a mark of faith over our lives. It's basically saying, I need you to choose the best. I need you to think the best. I need you to give your best. I need you to look for the best in other people. I need you to go out and be your best and to do good with what I've entrusted you to do. The Bible goes on, and if you look a bit backwards, in 2 Peter chapter 5 to 8, the Bible says, do your best to improve your faith. You can do this by adding goodness, understanding, self-control, patience, devotion to God. Concern for others in love. If you keep growing in this way, it will show that what you know about our Lord Jesus Christ has made your lives useful and meaningful. I think it goes without saying that if I can speak on behalf of the leadership and the pastoral at a live church is that we desire our lives and your lives to be useful and meaningful. We want you to have a purpose-driven life. We want you to affect change. As, peace, as Pastor Lisa was just saying, you know, we're raising up these children. They're a part of our church today to be leaders for tomorrow. We want their lives to be ones that are useful and meaningful and affecting change, even in their schools and in the communities and the kids that they play with. 
We need to make sure that we're improving our faith in how we live. We need to make sure that we're drawing down on what the Bible offers and standing upon the promises of God and saying that we want to be people of boldness and what he's called us to do. Proverbs 3 verses 9 and 10 says this. It says, honor the Lord by giving him your money and the first part of all of your crops. Then you will have more grain and grapes than you will ever need. More grain and grapes than you will ever need. Ultimately, what this verse is saying is, if you put God as first place in your life, God will bless you back. What God is saying is, if you give God the first part of your day and in your quiet time, he will bless you back. We give God the first part of our money because it's our tithe, and we honor God in that because we want him to be first place. We give God the first part of our week in Sunday and why we meet corporately, even though we're meeting online right now, the reality is we set aside our Sunday because we say, God, you're first. It's the beginning of my week. If you want God to bless you back, you have to start to look at where he is in your priority list. You see, we meet people time and time again, and they say, you know what, my marriage, man, it's just rocked and it's terrible, and we just can't seem to come eye to eye, and I don't know how to figure things out. And I think a question that we have to ask ourselves and that we ask when I'm sitting with those people is where is God in the list of priorities as it relates to your marriage? Is he first? You know what, man? My kids are dysfunctional. They're never obedient. They're causing a lot of strife and and discomfort and confusion in our home. Is God first place in your parenting? You know what, Pastor Nate, my finances never line up. I never have enough money to pay for the bills, and I don't know where it's all going to come from, and I'm really concerned. That's why I don't tithe. I would say, you know what, there's a question mark there. That's exactly why you should tithe, because if God is first place in your resources, he will release and blow out the blessing upon your life, so much so you won't be able to hold it in your hands. Where is God in that? And maybe this morning you're sitting and saying, well, I just, I don't know how to do that. How do I exactly give him my best? How do I step out and just say that, God, I'm going to trust you with that? Well, I'd like to encourage you today to stop going to empty wells for the solutions. So much of the time we go to these empty wells and these empty places, we rely on people and and Google and all these other things that we go to to say, "I, I guess the answers are in this. You know where the answers are? They're in the Bible. They're in a relationship with Jesus. They're in a right standing with the Heavenly Father that says, I love you so much and I'm going to care for you, but I've got to be first place. I expect your best. And it's with this this morning that we find really the the base camp of our scripture in 2 Timothy. And that's what I'm going to be speaking on today when we look at how to give God our best. Because that's the way I want to live. That's what I'm encouraging you to do today is I want you to live from a place that say, God, you are best. You are first place. You are my one and only. Without you, I have nothing And when we look at the writings of Paul in 2 Timothy, he gives us three great metaphors and illustrations. He looks at three different types of individuals. He looks at the effective soldier and the competitive athlete and the productive farmer. And when we look at 2 Timothy and we unpack it, there's so many things that we can take from today. And I'm hoping that they're application for you to bring encouragement and life and to bring you into a place of living this full-blown faith life that God has called you to live. And so if you have your Bible with you this morning, I would encourage you to crack it open. It'll be on the screen for you as well, for those that would rather not grab the Bible. But in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 7, the passage says this. It says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of these things. You see, again, our desire as the pastoral team of a live church is not for you to settle for second place. So much of the time, it's like where we look to settle is in second place, and God is calling us to be our best. The Bible is saying that you have the opportunity to stand in that position. And so when we look at the front end of that scripture, he talks about the soldier, the effective soldier. And for this morning, I believe there's three things when we look at the effective soldier that each one of us can learn from. The very first one is this. We must define what we're willing to die for. 
We must define what we're willing to die for. And maybe you're sitting there this morning, you're saying, that's a really weird place, Pastor Nate, to start from, because I don't really want to die. And don't worry, I'm not ready to die either. I want to live and I want to do the things God's called me to do. But a soldier understands what he's willing to die for. And I truly believe that unless you can define what you're willing to die for, you can't define what you're willing to live for. I would go so far as to say that you don't even understand how to love until you know what you're willing to die for. Soldiers understand the worth of a life and know that there are some things that are worth dying for. Freedom is worth dying for. We have so many soldiers that serve our country and have been so faithful over history to serve our nation and why so many of us get to have the comforts that we do today because they said, you know what, your freedom is worth dying for and I'm willing to stand in the gap and in the line of duty and do what I'm called to do for your freedom. They understand that it's worth dying for. Family is worth dying for. Putting yourself out for your family and saying, you are worth it, you matter. I'm willing to sacrifice my own comforts because you're worth dying for. Faith is worth dying for. And it's great and it's beautiful that we live in a country that we have the opportunity to celebrate in God's grace. But there are many people around the world that give their lives every minute of the day because of their desire to say, Jesus is first place in my life. And they give up that right. There are some things that are worth dying for. And soldiers understand it. But no better than this, Jesus understood it, and he expressed it. In John chapter 15, verses 13, the Bible says, And here is how to measure it. The greatest love is shown when a person lays down their life for their friends. Soldiers fight alongside of other soldiers in combat, and they know what it means to lay down their life for a brother. And that's exactly what Jesus did for you and me, as he said, You know what? You matter more than anything and I'm coming to be your Savior, and I'm coming to lay down my life for you so that you can be in a place of forgiveness and an eternity with a heavenly Father that loves you. It was the greatest expression of love that we could ever receive. The greater the sacrifice, the deeper the love. And Jesus gave it all. The second thing that we can learn from soldiers to be the best that he's called us to be, which is what God is calling us to do, is I must sacrifice my comfort. You think about all the comforts that soldiers give up. Soldiers serve in the heat. It can be in the sweltering heat with all of the gear on and everything that they're carrying out into battle, yet they still serve. They can be called into the coldest of places and they're completely shivering and cold and abandoned, yet they still serve. They give up their schedule to their commanding officer. They say, my time is not my own, yet it is what I am called to do. I've never met a wealthy soldier. Soldiers give up the ability to have, you know, this amount of wealth that so many other people could go off and earn in business and in commerce and so many different things because they say, I'm called to this and it's worth the cost. I'm willing to give up my comfort. See, I don't meet great people that weren't willing to sacrifice. I believe greatness actually comes through sacrifice. And if we want to be great men and great women of God, it's going to come through some element of sacrifice. Doing what's easy is comfortable. You become great by committing to something that's greater than yourself, understanding the purpose, and then being willing to sacrifice for it because it's greater than you. It's about the call that God has. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the character that God is willing to develop in your life. 2 Timothy 2 verses 3 says, Take your share of suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ just as I do. And I get it. We sit back and say, well, I don't want suffering and I don't want hardship. Yet we all have them in our lives. And the question I would have is, you know, what is following Christ making difficult for you? There's a cost to serving and loving Jesus. There's a cost. And maybe at times you feel like you're criticized. You get to meet people and they don't, you know, identify with who you are. And they kind of say, you know, you're just a little too strange. You're a little too weird for me. You're a little too, you know, sold out for that Jesus. And your criticism moves to ostracism and you feel ostracized. It costs you something. If serving Jesus was easy, then everybody probably would be doing it. Because doing what's easy is the least path of resistance. But God calls us to stand out. And it's going to be always easier to do what's wrong. That's why it's easier to hold resentment. That's why it's easier to say that I'm just not going to let go than it is to forgive. 
And so many people choose that path over and over and over again. But what they don't recognize is that the path to greatness and the path to being great for God and the path to being your best that all God has called you to be is going to come through some element of understanding what you're willing to die for and then understanding that you're going to have to sacrifice the comforts in your life. The third thing that we learn from the soldier is that I must eliminate distractions to be the best that I can for God. I've got to be focused. 2 Timothy 2 verses 4 says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. When a soldier is laid at bay and when a soldier is taking a time of rest, if his commanding officer walks into that room and says, guys, it's time to get up and go, there's an immediate response to them getting up and going to the call that they've put over the responsibility that they have and what the commanding officer is giving them to do. They understand the investment. My question to you this morning is, how many things are you investing your time in right now that in five years aren't going to matter at all. If we want to be the best for God, we've got to understand that there's a sacrifice. We need to spend more of our time, more of our energy, more of our resources on things that are going to last forever, on kingdom purposes and kingdom principles. And I think a thought for each one of us this morning and something that I've been weighing myself is I need to start to look at my own schedule and say, what could I set down so that I allow more room in my life for the things of God? Because I believe each one of us is filling our schedules with things that really aren't going to matter five years from now. Yet on that day when we stand before a heavenly father, we'll be looking back and saying, I really would have liked to have done more with the time that I was entrusted with. I trust God. It's here that Paul moves away from our first example of the soldier and he begins to introduce the competitive athlete. And in my life, I grew up in a lot of athletics and I love to play sport. But I definitely recognize that there's something different between an athlete that approaches things casually and somebody who approaches them competitively. The Bible often compares our lives to living in a race. The Bible looks at us and says, you're in a race, and we should be set on a race to do what? To win. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And in 1 Corinthians, we find this verse in chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. The Bible says, in a race, everyone runs. But only one person gets first prize. It's going to be me, by the way. Um, So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. Focus. An athlete, you know, he goes to his trouble just to win with a blue ribbon or a silver cup. But we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. So I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should do, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might be declared unfit and ordered to stand aside. Similar to the soldier, I believe there's three elements that we pick up from the athlete that we can all learn from this morning. The first one is an athlete that is competitive sets out with the intention to win. We must intend to win. So what does that require? Well, that requires intentionality. I must be intentional in the things I'm setting my time, my energy, and my resources towards. I recognize that I'm not going to become great. You're not going to become great by accident. You're not going to become great by approaching everything casually. It will only happen if we are intentional. And I believe in my life I've met many people that are just casual Christians versus competitive Christians. They're just going through the motions on autopilot. If I was to paint it in more today's terms for so many people, is there a difference between the casual golfer and the competitive golfer? Yes, I've golfed with them. They are way more serious when they're out on the golf course with me than I am as a casual golfer. But I believe that I've met Christians in my life that I say, you know what, I'm competing a lot harder than you. And I just want to say to you today that you can yourself say, you know what, I'm going to be done being casual in my relationship with Jesus. I'm going to start to become competitive. I'm going to lace up my Nikes. I'm going to put on my track pants. I'm going to do all the training. I'm going to discipline my body because I want to be ready to be the competitive athlete that God's called me to be. I want to run my race to win. But in order to do so, we've got to be intentional. 
Second thing that we learn from the competitive athlete is we must discipline ourselves. And I know I just said a taboo word whenever we talk about authority or discipline. So many people want to turn off online. Please don't do that. Discipline is important. No athlete becomes a pro athlete without discipline. You don't become mature if all you're taking is shortcuts. You don't move towards greatness if all you're taking is shortcuts. There needs to be a discipline in your life if you're moving forward towards greatness. 2 Timothy 2 verses 5 says, And if someone likewise competes as an athlete, he is not crowned as victor unless he competes according to the rules. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27, All athletes discipline in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But when we do it, we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. When we think about Olympic athletes, they give up so much for a gold medal. They give up so much for a silver medal or for a bronze medal. And I'm not making light of that, but they put their complete lives on hold for something that in five and ten years from now and in the eternal kingdom of heaven isn't going to be worth anything. What are we putting aside for the eternal prize? What are we saying for, I'm going to make room in my schedule, Jesus, for you. I'm going to make room in my schedule for things that matter. I'm going to make room in my schedule for love and for the word and to be pouring into other people's lives because I want to compete with a discipline in my life. Paul goes on and he talks about, but if we do the right things and if we do these for kingdom purposes, we're going after the eternal prize. I read a statement recently that said this, And I really believe it's true, and it was profound when I read it, that the pain of regret is always greater than the pain of discipline. Sometimes we look back and we say, if only I would have done that differently. If only I had more time. If only somebody was in my life and they would have given me the coaching and the wisdom and what I needed to look at that situation differently, I would have done it so much better. If we had a little bit more discipline, how different would our lives look? In my life, I know that it would be drastically different. I'm thankful for God's grace and forgiveness and opportunity, but I still believe that I required discipline. And so many people sit there, and maybe you're there today, and you're like, you know, how do, how do I do that, though? Like, I try and discipline myself, but I keep giving up. You know, I, I go so far. It's like most New Year's, um, you know, commitments that people make. They fall off the rails about 60 days in because they just can't follow through on the commitment And that's because willpower will only get you so far. But God's power will never run out. God's strength is eternal. His kingdom purposes are eternal. Third thing that we can learn from the athlete, if we want to be the best that we can be for God, is that we must stay focused on the reward. We must stay focused on the reward. And there's some people in their Christian walk that they say, really, like, so really, what is the payoff of doing good? What is the payoff of coming to church? What is the payoff of doing things right? What is the payoff of serving Jesus? Oh, I don't know. Eternity sounds pretty wonderful to me. And I'm excited about what it offers. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, too, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. He ran the race. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. You know what? As humans, we can handle an enormous amount of pain. An enormous amount of discomfort and discipline if we understand what the reward is. I've met time and time again with guys that I've trained with in the gym when I actually used to do more of that, and I know I could probably do more of that. Um, But, you know, I met guys who understood the pain that they were putting their bodies under because of what they were trying to achieve in the discipline of their training. You see, when we lose sight of the prize, when we lose sight of the reward, we often tend to give up. And sometimes in our walk with Jesus, we lose sight of what the eternal rewards are. And we get discouraged, and the enemy steps in, and he begins to bring condemnation and shame and guilt. And I just want you to know today that God can heal that and restore that and do something new. 
He brings freedom in every single one of those areas. And if we want to arrive in heaven one day and arrive at that gate, and when he looks at you and he calls out your name and he says, you did so well with what I entrusted you with, here's your prize. What a glorious day that'll be. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26. He says, so I run straight to the goal with purpose, with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. And I got to tell you today that there's too many Christians that are just shadow boxing and playing around. There's too many Christians that are air guitaring their way into heaven. <laughs> and you know what? The last time I looked, you're not making much music when you're air guitaring. You're just pretending. We got to stop pretending in our lives. We've got to get serious and focused and say, you know what? There are so many things that have distracted me from what God has called me to do. And I'm done putting up with the distractions. I'm going to begin to live an invested, intentional, focused life for him. Because I want to arrive and win the prize. I want to pay attention to love and the word of God and other people and what he's calling me to do. I want to stop wasting my time, energy, and resources on things that don't really matter. Finally, we have our third example in the productive farmer. 2 Corinthians, big piece of scripture here, so stick with me. But 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 13 says, Remember this, a farmer plants only a few seeds, will only get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will receive a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need that you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. That's eternal. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide an increase in your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. You know what, we could spend an entire week probably just pulling apart that scripture and do a whole other teaching. But you know what, for the benefit of time this morning, I just want to summarize it this way. Your life on earth is like tending and planting a garden. It doesn't really matter how many years you have. But again, if we look at the front end of this sermon, history and the Bible has shown us that it is not circular, that it is linear. And that we all only have a finite amount of days that God is calling you to plant. And we each have types of seeds that he's given us to plant. And the question is, are we going to plant generously or are we going to plant sparingly? Because i got to tell you that if you want to plant generously, the harvest will be great when you arrive in heaven. A mighty harvest. But if you make the decision that I would rather be meager in my planting and hold back the seeds that God's called me to plant, you will not only reap a sparing amount, very little Five times in the Bible, Jesus said, store up treasure for yourself in heaven. 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 You see, Jesus was repeating this because he's basically saying, I really want you to get this. I don't want you to miss it. And so I'm going to keep repeating it until you get it. And so how do we do that? We plant seeds of generosity over and over again. And I'm not just talking about your money and your resources. I'm talking about seeds of planting and helping someone else. Saying that, you know what, you're worth it for me to sacrifice my schedule. You are valuable enough for me to set down what I've been binge watching on Netflix because I know that you need me in this moment. It's a seed of generosity. When we say I'm going to be unselfish and I'm going to willingly give something to somebody because I recognize that they have a need, I'm planting a seed of generosity. When you put yourself out for others, you're planting seeds of generosity. And God calls us to plant as a generous giver. I'm going to wrap up my message here in, a more, in just a few moments. 
And as we bring our service to a conclusion this morning, I just want to let you know a final thought. That if you want to reap a great harvest, you've got to be willing to be bold. You've got to be willing to step out in faith. You've got to say, I'm going to generously plant in faith in the things that God has called me to do. Luke chapter 6, 38 says this, Give and you will receive. You will be given much. It will be poured out into your hands more than you can hold. You will be given so much that it will spill into your lap. The way you give to others is the way that God will give to you. Mark chapter 10, 29, 30 goes on and it says, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, everyone who has left his home, brothers, sisters, mother and father, children or fields, for me, for the good news, will get a hundred times more than he left. Here in this world, he will have more homes, brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, mothers in Christ, children in Christ, new opportunities of growth and planting and believing and trusting God in their fields. And with those things, he will also suffer for his belief. But in the age that is coming, we'll have life forever. Do you know what a hundredfold is? A hundredfold is 10,000% interest on your investment. 10,000%. I've met stockbrokers and I've met financial guys and I've never met one of them that have said, hey Nate, if you invest your resources with me, I'll give you 10,000 fold back on your money. Not one. I've never met an individual that says they can give me 10,000 back on my time. You see, there's only one stockbroker that can do that. There's only one firm that can do that, and it's called God and Sons. <laughs> That's where we need to make our investment. With God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the things he's calling us to do. Because his return is great and the rewards will be great. And the harvest will be plenty if we plant boldly and in faith with seeds of generosity. He's calling us to be all that we can be. He's saying to us that if we want to be the effective soldier that saves lives, if we want to be the competitive athlete that wins the prize, if we want to be the productive farmer that yields a crop a hundredfold, hmm, we must place our time, energy, resources, effort to be the best that we can be for God. What are we willing to lay down? What are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to say, God, you're worth it. You're worth it all. Every day, you're worth it all. I'm done holding things back from you. I'm done keeping parts of my life to myself. I need to start to live in a way that you're calling me to live. I'm sorry that I've been taking so many years to fulfill my desires, my plans, my goals, and what I want to do. I'm done doing it. I've wasted enough time. See, God can do a new thing. He could be doing it right now. I actually believe he is. I believe there's those of you this morning that have tuned in and you, you identify with this message and you identify with these individuals and what God has been showing us this morning and you're saying, now is the time for change. And so it's with that that I just want to pray for you this morning because I trust God and I've done that in my own life. I've given enough years to other things and I'm now in a place where I'm giving the years and my time to the right things and I'm seeing the harvest and I'm seeing what God is doing. That can be yours. And it doesn't have to come tomorrow. So wherever you're at right now, I just ask that wherever you're most comfortable, whether it is raising to your feet or dropping to your knees, just bow your head and let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for your promises. I thank you for your truth. I thank you, God, for moments. I thank you for opportunity. And God, I just ask right now that for whoever's watching this morning, God, that you would just begin, Father, just to fill their space with your Holy Spirit. That, God, as you've been doing what you can do this morning, what only you can do, as you've been tugging on the heartstrings, Lord God, as you've been doing a new work, as you've been stirring up the Spirit and bringing to the surface things that need to be dealt with, God, that you would be affecting change in us. God, would you remove the desire to be casual? 
Would you remove the desire to be complacent? Would you remove, Father God, the distractions? And God, would you bring forth an ushering of opportunity? And Father God, a, a sense, Father God, of competitiveness in our walk, in our relationship with you, to say that I want to compete in this race to win. And God, if there's those that are here today that have never met you, but that have been tuning in, I just want you to know that you can know Jesus and you can know him as your personal savior. All you have to do is say, Lord God, in my life, I've spent too many years doing the wrong things. I've been too many years paying attention to sin and I need you to come into my life. Would you come into my heart? I want you to be Lord and savior over my life and over everything that you've called me to do. I want to be born again. Would you forgive me? God wants to do a new thing today. Trust him to do it. Let him do it for you. God, we give you the rest of our day and our week and our time. And we trust you with it, God. We thank you that we can be bold people because we trust in a mighty lion that when you roar, Lord, you push back the darkness. And so, God, we place our lives in your hands.